Hello once again fellow teachers and students. Finally, I'm back to complete this series. I will introduce you to the reproductive parts of the plant and then I will leave this lecture series temporarily so I can improve my recording setup. So, without much further ado, let's have the flowers first. Flowers can be as little as that can be found in the duckweed at 0.1 mm long and can be as big as their flesh of flowers, which in my recent readings, the largest of them can be found in the Philippines. They can grow to more than a meter in diameter and can weigh up to 9 to 10 kilograms each. Aside from size ranges, in general, flowers can also vary in terms of colors, textures, and odors. As long as flowering plants thrive in a particular habitat, you will obviously expect flowers in them. Many flowers exist as a single structure on its own stalk or peduncle. While some can be observed as inflorescences, which are groups of several to hundreds of flowers. They have uh, many little stalks called pedicels attaching each flower to the main stalk. A peduncle or pedicel swells at its tip into a small pad known as the receptacle. The outermost whorl attached to it is consists of small, usually green, uh, leaf-like sepals which are collectively referred to as the calyx. It has a protective function while the flower is still in the bud, perhaps to uh, prevent desiccation or protection from insects. The next world of flower parts is where everyone is most familiar with when we talk about flowers. These are the petals, collectively known as the corolla, and they attract pollinators such as insects and birds. Collectively, the calyx and the corolla together are referred to as the perianth. So far, we have examined the non-reproductive structures. Let's now go to the male and female parts. Several to many stamens are attached to the receptacle around the base of the pistil in the center of the flower. Often, I tell my students that they should remember the men in stamen to recognize it as the male component of the flower. Each stamen consists of a slender filament with a sac called an anther at the top that contains the pollen grains. The pistil, on the other hand, is the female part and consists of the stigma, which is connected by a stalk-like style to the ovary. The ovary will later develop into a fruit and the ovules in it will become seeds. On this context, flowers can be categorized as complete or incomplete. Complete if it has both the male and female components, including the sepals and the petals. If one of them is lacking, the flower is said to be incomplete. In the case where only one reproductive part is present, a flower can be a pistillate. A flower can be pistillate if it only contains the female structures, and the staminate if it only has the male structures. You might encounter these terms in a variety of textbooks. Now we go to the ovary. The ovary is said to be superior if the calyx and corolla are attached to the receptacle at the base of the ovary, or inferior when the receptacle grows up around it so that the calyx and corolla appear to be attached at the top. One or more egg-shaped ovules lies within small cavities in the ovary. These are attached to the walls by means of short stalks called the funicle. Fertilization usually determines whether or not the ovary or ovaries of a flower will develop into fruit. If some of the ovules are not fertilized, the flower normally dies. Pollen grains and developing seeds also have hormones that stimulate fruit growth and development. Some fruits even develop without fertilization via partenocarpy. Let us now examine the generalized structure of a fruit. A typical mature fruit has three regions collectively known as the pericarp. The outermost skin forms the exocarp, while the inner boundary around the seeds forms the endocarp. The endocarp may be hard and stony as in a peach or papery as in apples. Or it may not be distinct from the mesocarp, which is the fleshy tissue between the exocarp and the endocarp. Fruits may either be fleshy or dry at maturity and they may split, exposing the seeds. I will be showing you some of the major categories. Fleshy fruits have mesocarps that are partly fleshy at maturity. A drupe is a simple fleshy fruit with a single seed enclosed by a hard stony endocarp or pit. The mesocarp is not always obviously fleshy. In coconuts, for example, the husk, which is usually removed for the rest of the fruit is sold in markets, is very fibrous. The seed of the uh, coconut, uh, the meat, is uh, hollow and contains a watery endosperm, surrounded by the thick, hard endocarp, typical of drupes. Other examples of drupes include the stone fruits like apricots, cherries, peaches, plums, olives, and almonds. Berries usually develop from a compound ovary and commonly contain more than one seed. The entire pericarp is fleshy and it is difficult to distinguish between the mesocarp and the endocarp. Three types of berries may be recognized. A true berry is a fruit with a thin skin and a pericarp that is relatively soft at maturity. 
Typical examples include tomatoes, grapes, peppers, and eggplants. Pepos are berries with relatively thick rinds. Fruits of uh, the members of the pumpkin family. Your pumpkin, cucumbers, watermelons, and squashes are pepos. The Hesperidium, on the other hand, is a berry with a leathery skin containing oils. Numerous outgrowths from the inner lining of the ovary wall become sac-like and swollen with juice as the fruit develops. All members of the citrus family produce this type of fruit, like oranges, lemons, limes, and pomelo. Pomes are simple fleshy fruits derived from the enlarged uh, floral tube or receptacle that grows up around the ovary. The endocarp around the seeds is papery or leathery. Examples include apples and pears. In an apple, the ovary consists of the core and a little adjacent tissue. Now let's go to dry fruits. Fruits whose uh, mesocarp is definitely dry at maturity are classified as dry fruits and can be dehiscent or indehiscent. Dry fruits that split at maturity are uh, distinguished from one another by the way they split. For example, the follicle splits along one side only, exposing the seeds within. The legium splits along two sides, or seams. Examples include peas, beans, lentils. Peanuts are also legumes that develop and mature underground. Silics also split along two sides or seams, but the seeds are born on a central partition, which is exposed when the two halves of the fruit separate. They are produced by members of the mustard family, which includes broccoli, cabbage, and radish. Capsules consist of at least two carpels and split in a variety of ways. Examples include mahogany, lilies, and okra. In dry fruits that do not split at maturity, or uh, shall we say indehiscent fruits, the single seed is to uh, varying degrees united with the pericarp. The base of the single seed of the aiken is attached to its surrounding pericarp. The sunflower seeds is consist of uh, the edible kernel plus the husk which constitute the aiken. Nuts are one-seeded fruits similar to aikens but they are generally larger and the pericarp is much harder and thicker. They develop with a cup or cluster of bracts at their base. Here we have a grain. The pericarp of the grain is tightly united with the seed and cannot be uh, separated from it easily. You will probably have observed that in rice. All members of the grass family, including corn, wheat, oats, and barley, produce grains. In Samaras, the pericarp uh, surrounding the seeds extends out in the form of a wing or membrane. So as you can see here, uh, it is obviously uh, used for uh, dispersal. The uh, twin fruit called the schizocarp is unique to the parsley family. Members of this family include the uh, parsley, carrots, and anise. Some other categories of fruits are based on how the structures of origin lump together. So here we have an aggregate fruit that is derived from a single flower with several to many pistils. The individual pistils develop into tiny fruitlets but the, as they mature, uh, they cluster as a unit on a singular receptacle. Examples include the raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries. Multiple fruits are derived from several to many individual flowers in a single inflorescence. Each flower has its own receptacle. But as the flowers mature separately into fruitlets, they develop together into a single larger fruit as, as in uh, your aggregate fruits. Examples include mulberries and pineapples. And finally, we have the seeds. The concave side of a typical bean seed here has a small white scar called the hilo. The hilo marks the point at which the ovule was attached to the ovary wall. A tiny pore called the micropyle is located right next to the hilo. If this is placed in water, it will swell and split the seed coat. Once the seed coat is removed, the two halves called cotyledons can be distinguished. These are the food storage organs that also function as the first seed leaves of the seedling plant. The cotyledons and the tiny rudimentary bean plant to which they are attached constitute the embryo. Monocot seeds as in grasses have only one cotyledon, a tiny embryo plantlet with uh, undeveloped leaves and a meristem at the upper end of the embryo shoot is called the plumule. The cotyledons are attached just below the plumule. Right here, the uh, very short part of the stem above the cotyledons is called the epicotyl. I think I have shown you these structures in my root lecture video. So the stem below the attachment point is the hypocotyl. In an embryo, it's uh, often difficult to tell where the uh, stem ends and the root begins. But the tip that will develop into a root is called the radical. When a kidney bean germinates, the hypocotyl lengthens and bends, becoming hook-shaped. The top of the hook emerges from the ground, pulling the cotyledons above the ground. And once the cotyledons have emerged, the hook straightens out. In corn, the bulk of the food storage tissue is the endosperm. 
The plumule and the radicle are enclosed in uh, tubular sheathing structures called the coleoptile and the coleoriza. These protect the uh, delicate tissues as the seeds germinate. After the coleoptile and the coleoriza have become several millimeters long, their development ceases and the plumule and the radical burst through the tips. In order to germinate, the seed must first be viable and require a period of dormancy until cracks in the seed coat are initiated by the mechanical abrasion of rock particles in the soil or maybe uh, alternate thawing and freezing in uh, temperate countries. And of course, microbial action. Water and uh, oxygen are also essential to the completion of germination and light or its absence also plays a role. After water has been imbibed, enzymes begin to function in the cytoplasm which is now being uh, rehydrated. Digestive enzymes convert stored proteins to amino acids. Others convert fats and oils to soluble compounds or aid in the conversion of starch to sugar. So uh, that's it guys, the flowers, fruits, and seeds in a nutshell. To save time, I lump them together in this single lecture video. Additional information on this topic is always available in a variety of textbooks. So please, I encourage you students to read more after learning from a short digital content such as this. No YouTube teacher here can provide more knowledge than a good textbook, but I hope this was helpful. This is Professor Brian Ives Araneta. Thank you very much for watching.